Anybody else have a... Yeah. I, I came in late, but um, did you talk about um, the, the, the movie rights and, and what you feel about having your book made into a movie? Um, yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's good. Uh, it, it's been a long, weird, uh, strange process of, uh, you know, optioning the movie, and there have been practically every famous person that you ever heard of in Hollywood has had some, has had their hands on it at some point, and so there were all these things where it's like, oh, the, you know, this is great, so-and-so, X, Y, Z, really interested, and then in the end it just doesn't happen. This was over a year of these things happening, so actually when they finally did decide to to make, make a real deal, it was a big surprise, even though, because there have just been so many disappointments to then. Will you be involved? Um, we tried to put in the contract that they would be um, obligated to use my music in the movie, which they wouldn't quite like put that on in, in, in the contract. So they, they have a they had a thing saying they would they would have, make good faith efforts. <laughs> but it, it you know so I don't know I I don't want to be that involved. Like I you know I think that would just be a lot of a headache and frustration and. I just, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not, I, don't, I never made a movie, I never wrote a script, I wouldn't do a good job. So I just want, I want, I would like to see what, I'd like to be an audience member and see what it came out like. But it would be pretty cool if they used my songs. So I hope that they do. Because also that would be a way to get a little more money too. So. <laughs> <laughs> you always have that consideration. The yeah. songs that they wouldn't put in is actually not about a bad CD. <laughs> there you go. Yes, I always have that. I always have that. Uh, I always have that option. I can put out because that's that's the other great. That's the other great thing that you don't really that you don't realize uh, until you've actually been doing it is how much as a as a, a writer of a book. It's not quite the same as with music and recordings and everything. You own almost everything, and no matter what, I mean, you really do. You own think forever, pretty much. And so that's you know, that's kind of cool. I mean, they can like Random House. Would have they couldn't say they wanted to make a King Dork theme park? Um, I would. They would have to give me some money. Um, <laughs> my understanding of the fine points of the legal system. Uh, any other uh, action figure questions? dolls? <laughs> That'd be awesome. But yeah, well, we we'll, we'll getting ahead of ourselves a little bit there, you know. Um, I, yeah, mo but the more things, the more things, the better, really. How, how close is uh, Tom's uh, band, early band experience to yours? Um, it, it's pretty close. Um, I think that his, the difference between my attempts at having bands and his, I mean, it, it was similarly inept <coughs> and, and uh, doomed to failure, but I think he had... He has higher concepts than than I had, you know. I mean, I just was. I, I would. I would. And in in the end, I think. He, in the end, I think that's something that he kind of learns towards the, not completely, but towards the end. Is like, you just are feel like you have achieved amazing success if you can actually get it so that everybody shows up, like at this, on the same day. And then if you can make it through one song, then you're just like, God, show business success. I and mean, it's like the, the grand schemes. Like Tom Henderson has, I mean, they, they do tend to stay in your notebook um, when you're in, in high school or even when you're in your 30s. So, <laughs> so it goes. Was uh, Sam John Bond at all? No. Reading no, no. into it. No. Um, I, I did have an alphabetical order friend when I was in, um, in uh, high school, but uh, we never had bands together. But, uh, no, I, I, I wish I'd had a. Sam Hellerman to, to kind of talk me through everything when I was a, when I was a young man. And no, John, the whole, that's a, the John Vaughn chapter of my life, maybe, you know, the seventh volume of the King Dork story might include a John Vaughn figure, I don't know. Well. Read some more. Read some more. Really? Yeah. God, I, no one ever wants, that's a book. Page 78. Read. Page 78? <laughs> <laughs> I shudder to... <laughs> really? <laughs> it's after you, you know. Um, after the 
girl experience. After the, yeah, okay. All right, so this is, all right, I'll, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so it, the, my character has a um, sort of unexpected and mysterious encounter with a, a, a mysterious female at a stoner party. And uh, <laughs> it spends some time trying to analyze the implications. And so this is, uh, this is where, um, okay, the Fiona, Fiona is the name of this chick. The Fiona Couch episode had been the most successful interaction with a female in my life, surpassing many of my least plausible dreams. A case could be made that it had been my only genuine interaction with a non-related female ever, the previous ones having taken place in my head as pure fantasy, or in the real world, right, and an object of amusement rather than a true participant. How could I not be obsessed? It was the most significant event in my life so far, by far. Um, <clears throat> I've got to skip a couple things. Here. The central most important question was, why had Fiona decided to kiss on me and everything when no previous girl I'd ever come in contact with would have been caught dead in that situation. I came up with six points or topics for discussion, which I present in ascending order of validity, <laughs> one being the most valid, along with some of my notes. Six. She was impressed with the band. True, she hadn't seemed too interested, but when I first mentioned the stoned Marmadukes, she said, yeah? And there was something about that yeah that seemed a little more fascinating than other yeahs I'd experienced in my life. Dubious yet possible. Five. She was captivated by my masterful command of the English language. By my count, I had said no more than 21 words to her, and that's only if you count um. And my first bit of dialogue had been nothing less retarded than, I'm cool. But clearly, my ability to make words my slaves had had some comedic effect, and girls dig guys that can make them laugh, at least they do according to scripts written by TV and film comedy writers. Likely, but not necessarily critical. Four, she had no idea who I was and hadn't figured out that I was an untouchable. Lack of accurate information had to have been a factor, and anonymity. I only know her first name, and she didn't know any of my names. But was that enough, the mere fact that my reputation had not preceded me? Could I have come off as some kind of cool dude when disassociated from Chimo, the dork, the myth, the legend? Hardly. I still radiated Venus, I'm sure. Three, Fiona prefers dorks. I've heard there are girls with this fetish. It's a complicated <laughs> matter that I don't completely understand, but I guess it mainly applies to girls who, for one reason or another, can't do any better and who persuade themselves that settling for a degree of dorkiness is better than nothing. Are there any girls uh, as hot-looking as Fiona in that category? No way. But maybe her instinctive alternativeness in her capacity as a CHS drama mod made her more tolerant of dorkiness, less repelled by it, even when it radiated from the anonymous king of the super dorks. Two, she knew no one was watching. This one goes almost without saying. One, she was totally high. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not a bad one.